There we go. Good morning, party people. Welcome to Office Hours, the stream where I answer your top voted questions from PollGab. Um, Morse says uh, SQL Consultant Sass and Roasts at this hour. I'm on jet lag big time, so I came back from Iceland. Even I flew back two mornings ago. I'm not exactly sure in terms of hours. I've slept in the house twice. That's probably the best way to count it. Uh, and so we had all kinds of flight problems getting back. We were stuck in a blizzard, had all kinds of things. Hey, Shane Ellis, good to see you again. Um, so had all kinds of uh, crazy problems getting back to the house after Iceland. Um, it's always, you know, when it, the further that you have to jump across time zones, the riskier it is. We only had two flights, like from Reykjavik to Seattle and then Seattle to Vegas. Um, but because we missed the first flight due to a blizzard, then we couldn't get the second, the, the, the rebook of that. We couldn't get into Seattle. We had to go to Boston. Then we had to book a new set of tickets. It was all a big mess. But the thing that I'm most excited about is I got like six liters of vodka, I'm sorry, uh, of gin uh, that you can only get in Iceland. There were these different brands that I love that are really hard to get in the United States. Um, and I was just absolutely tickled pink that all of them made it uh, to the house without, you know, th through the check bags and all that, without uh, losing any bottles for breakage, which was amazing. It's harder than it sounds. So let's take your top voted questions from PollGab. The top voted question, let's see, is from Suresh. Let me make sure that this actually shows up. Just a second here. My browser's acting a little wonky. Show the Suresh, Suresh question. Suresh says, hi, Brent. Question about 128 gigabyte memory limit for standard edition. If I set max memory to 228 gigs of RAM, he's got, he's got 256 in the box. Instead of being using just 128, he wants to use 228. He says, will SQL Server use the additional 100 gigabytes for basically anything other than the buffer pool? Is that a correct assumption? So the thing is, Microsoft has never really documented exactly what will happen above standard editions memory limits. There are sessions out there from different people who run experiments on it, um, and they can tell you what it was like at one point in time. But the problem with stuff like 128 gig memory limits is that can change what the behavior above and beyond the 128 can change at any given time. Microsoft can fix the bug, so to speak, in the office uh, space TV jokes, uh, fix the bug. And then suddenly the behavior over 128 can change. Um, what I can tell you is, is that I have seen people have success with column store index usage, not buffer pool, but like create and recreate indexes uh, above 128 gigs. But if you find yourself reliably needing more than 128 gigs of RAM for specific scenarios, that's when really you have to start stepping up to Enterprise Edition. Otherwise, every time you apply an update, I'm just really worried about what's going to happen to you, especially as you change from uh, version to version. Next up, Jens says, I have two 20-year-old databases with no clustered indexes. The key columns are some are unique identifier and some are integer. A colleague of mine changed all the table key columns to be clustered indexes, and suddenly everything became noticeably slower. Is it a bad idea to have a clustered index? Well, Jens, there is such a thing, or Jens, Hens, there is such a thing as the wrong clustered index, just as there's such a thing as the wrong non-clustered index. What probably happened is that your colleague chose the wrong columns for indexing. And what might make more sense is that you might have situations where a, a column that is currently a non-clustered index might make better sense as the clustering key. If you want to learn how to design clustering keys, check out my Mastering Index Tuning class. I have a module just around designing uh, clustered indexes, um, and it revolves around the sunny principle, static, unique, narrow, and ever-increasing. The more of those that you can match, the better off you're generally going to be. Let's see here. Next up, Paul says, I've got a production database approaching 16 terabytes. Adding another data file to the primary solution, primary uh, uh, file group is one solution. Are there any disadvantages to creating a new file group on a different drive and then moving large tables and indexes into it? 
So there are a few. Um, the disadvantages can involve you're going to require more space temporarily as you do that move. It's going to be very storage intensive. You're essentially reading every uh, uh, table and then writing it somewhere else. This can blow out your availability groups, blow out replication, blow out database mirroring. Anytime you're doing large amounts of writes, you got to be worried about what's happening to the servers on the other end. Do they have the same amount of space? Um, or it's going to blow out your backups because to SQL Server, this is a logged activity where it's actually writing down what it's changing. Um, so that if what you might consider doing just to get past the emergency quickly is add another file to that existing file group and then long term uh, make decisions about how you would gradually incrementally uh, move stuff over to another file group and the goal of doing that moving to another file group is that as you move the objects into there your objects are evenly balanced across all the files you have in that new file group so when you do it with that new file group put at least four files into it on four different volumes so that way they can all grow gradually over time. Jessica says I'm here for the salt and the uh, I only have two servers left on Microsoft SQL Server. Postgres is pervasive on the new apps I'm supporting. Yeah it's interesting it's a, it's a wild time as a database administrator. I'm curious to what see what Microsoft does with SQL Server 2025 and licensing. It would be wise for them to make SQL Server more approachable, especially given the competition it's got from other databases. Uh, Shane says, we're getting more and more new databases coming our way in Postgres. I just wish there was a smart way to learn Postgres. <laughs> Where's my... Oh, I don't have this. There we go. I like it. Let's see here. Next up... Uh, TalkTick asks, what are your top recommended books uh, for SQL Server? Go to brentozar.com slash go slash books. brentozar.com slash go slash books. I have to warn you, the books are old. The reasons behind that is that it doesn't make financial sense to write a book in the year 2025. You lose your shirt. You lose a ton of money writing books. Uh, so it's really something that people only do for vanity projects or when they're being paid by somebody else. Uh, for example, Microsoft have, uh, tends to publish books on a regular basis, but because they pay the authors to do that kind of thing. Enough stuff asked. Does SQL Server natively support compression? Yes, in lots of different ways, too, as well. Next up, Gary says, Hi B, we have a production database that periodically experiences hundreds of long lock waits and blocking on that same proc. Oddly, every one of those waiting sessions is a lead blocker of a compile wait. I don't see recompile used anywhere. Why is SQL trying to compile? Well, Gary, what most people would do is they would ask, what causes a procedure to recompile? They wouldn't give me 15 minutes worth of background history, but that's great. For you. So let's answer the simple question. What causes queries to recompile? Statistics changing on the object. Uh, environment options changing. So if somebody changes a max stop, a cost threshold for parallelism. If someone uh, recompiles from outside, like does uh, DB, what is it, SP recompile, passes in an object or a table. A table will do it for any of the tables in the plan. If the server comes under memory pressure uh, and it, that plan is released because it uh, hasn't been used in a while or because other things are forcing memory usage. So that the way that you would track that down is go find out if any of those things are happening in your environment. The other thing that you can do, the place that I would probably start is SP Blitz. SP Blitz is my free server health check utility, and it'll tell you if people are running things like uh, uh, DBCC free proc cache. It'll tell you if stats are changing rapidly in the environment, all kinds of stuff like that. Next up, my T got cold says, my devs use temporal tables a lot. Can you tell me any horror stories about them? No, not really, because I, I haven't touched them that much. The, nothing against them. They're fine. Uh, the problem is that just their temporal, their time basis is based on whenever the rows are inserted, updated, or deleted. And the clients that I've had that needed temporal stuff, they really wanted to drive that temporal date based off of a business date. Like they would insert something with a change date uh, in it, and they wanted the temporal table to be driven by that instead of system time. Um, 
So I have absolutely no nothing good or bad otherwise to say about temporal tables just because I haven't used them. I don't all, also I don't hear a lot of widespread complaints about them. I do, it's not one of those things that people go, oh my god, temporal tables they just suck. Oh. The, the stuff that sucks is stuff that you can just read the documentation and understand. If you alter a table, for example, you're going to run into problems on the temporal table side of it. So just be careful of that. Next up, Bandu says, what's your faith level in third-party SQL backup software? Very high. It's, it's not like it's a new phenomenon. Third-party backup stuff for SQL Server has been out for like 25 years now. Uh, so the, the, I don't want to say all the bugs are worked out because it's software. There are always bugs, but my faith in SQL Server backup tools is pretty high. Speaking of backups, archivists asked, I'm trying to make backups faster by making my cold data read-only. How do I decide if I should make a read-only database, move, make, move archive tables over to a read-only file group, or partition tables and make part of them read-only? The thing that you want to do, because you said you're trying to make backups faster, what's the fastest backups that you can run? No backups at all, which means if you have read-only databases where the whole thing is read-only as an archive, that's an excellent way to do it. And then you could back those things up, say, just like once a week, or have a setup that whenever the uh, database flips from uh, read-only to writable, that you immediately take a backup at that point and put it into your regular backup rotations. Now, that stuff is all scriptable. It's, uh, I, the thing that I would say is you want to automate that, because what everybody says is, oh, we're never going to change this data. And then what do they do 20 minutes later? Well, except sometimes. Sometimes we change it, and then you're right back to where you started with. Um, whereas if you put the data in a read-only file group or use partitioning, you're still going to have to do full database backups from time to time because you're going to want to make restores really quick. Next up, Neil says, a frequently used dashboard randomly chooses a horrible plan and kills a production server. I tried forcing the plan with Query Store. It works for a while and then fails, says the index it uses no longer exists. But I didn't drop any indexes that I know of. Not sure where I should look next. Well, that's really cool. What you do is you go to the plan, go to the plan that you're forcing, and look at it. Crazy, right? Look at that plan and go see what the indexes are. When you look at the XML of the plan, you're going to be able to see the index ID. And that way, if somebody's changing the index, like if they're dropping it and recreate it, I've seen people do stupid things like their index rebuild scripts decide to drop and recreate the index, or they create a new index and then drop the old one or do it with drop existing. If the ID is changing, that can run you into problems there. I don't think that's what it is. I don't think the index is actually changing, but I think that if you look at the plan, all of a sudden you'll go, oh, wait, no, it is asking for an index, and somebody else must have dropped that index. So that can help. Also, don't just look at the one table that you think is involved. Look at all the tables in the execution plan, because it might be one that you didn't realize somebody was joining to. And then let's see here, uh, the tech guy says, the role of a DBA seems very blurred, at least in my organization, as well as keeping the lights on. We're asked to develop integrations, exchanging data, uh, and own that process. Where do you stand on that? So it's like any job. I was going to say welcome to 2025, but welcome to 1995. As long as I've had jobs, managers have wanted to give good people unrelated tasks. When you're good at your job, people bring you more work. Oh, they're a sharp person. They seem to tackle everything. Let's give them more things because these are things that we need done. So the trick is you need to start sucking at your job. If you suck at your job, people won't bring you more tasks. They'll say, oh, don't get everything to the tech guy 23. That person never gets their existing work done, let alone any new work. Man, we just got to give them enough time that they can do their existing duties. Who else can we talk to? So there's your solution. Is that really the solution? Of course not. You want to be valuable in your organization. It's up to you to figure out where to draw that line, how much work you actually do versus how much work you say. And, and my personal favorite technique 
My personal favorite technique is to pull up my task list. I use RememberTheMilk.com, but there are all kinds of variations over there. I'll pull open my task list and show it to people and say, oh, great, okay, so this thing you want me to do, where does it rank in relation to everything else on this list? And if you want me to push other things out of the way, that's cool. Tell me what you want. And then once you've decided where that lands, let's go to my manager and make sure that they have approval to push everything else down lower in priority in this list. Because I have an appointment today at 5.15 p.m. I've got to get out of the office at 5 o'clock so I can go through and make that appointment. Um, and the people, I don't, especially us tech people who suffer from uh, inferiority complexes, we are like, oh, I would never say I have an appointment at 5.15 because they're going to ask what it is. Sorry, it's something that I can't discuss. I hope that's fair. What I do outside of the office, it's not something that's, you know, I, I want it, I'm comfortable sharing. Or I have a family commitment, things like that. Because after all, you do have a family commitment. You are your own family. Uh, Enough Stuff says, sorry, I wanted to ask if uh, SQL Server natively supports compression at the network transport level. Um, so the thing is, is if you find yourself sending so much data from SQL Server out to the application, you want to start asking why, because a database isn't meant to be a filing cabinet where you go, okay, give me all the orders since 1966. Generally speaking, you want to keep the amount of data that you're pulling in and pushing out back and forth to a reasonable level. I always think about it as web pages, right? How much data do you really need in order to render a web page? I don't mean HTML. I don't mean all your CSS. I mean data. How much data do you actually need? And then people start to th think back and go, wait a minute, oh, I, I think I was approaching this the wrong way. I've never seen a problem, a database performance problem that I wanted to solve with network compression. You might have one, but your better choice there is going to be a network compression appliance, something that you put in at the network level. Because then if you have that much of a problem with data shoving across between your SQL server and your app servers, then you also have that problem between the app servers and the clients, and those uh, appliances will help you compress everything everywhere. All right, there's a good round of questions there. I'm going to go set up for this morning's consulting client. Today I have a fun one. Somebody with uh, tens of terabytes worth of data in SQL Server, and they're trying to basically run it on a laptop, and they want to see if there's anything that they can do from a development perspective uh, before they go shell out hundreds of thousands of dollars more for SQL Server licensing. Kind of fun. There's also a really good thing for, tip for your career. Um, the more that you can attach yourself to expensive problems, your costs look cheap in comparison. My salary, my consulting rates look cheap when the alternative is if you don't hire somebody like me, then you're going to be spending five, uh, six, seven figures worth of money on licensing for SQL Server. Hope you all had fun and learned something, and I will see you all on the next Office Hours. Adios.